Good morning, church. Once again, I'm going to welcome you. <coughs> oh, I got choked with that water. You know, the song says, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why we trust in him. It comes from a psalm, a psalm of trust. And <coughs> you can't trust somebody. Well, you could if you're one of those kind of people that just trust people. But you can't trust somebody if you don't know them. Well, I wouldn't. <laughs> Would you? You won't trust me if you don't know me. You won't trust Jesus if you don't know him. So if you want to know him, if you want to trust him, I should say, you've got to get to know him. And I think that series or this series that we're in speaks volumes of where we are and how we see Jesus and how we perceive him and receive him as our Lord and Savior. Because we've done the miracles, the seven signs of the Savior. But if you really want to know somebody, if you really want to put your trust in him, you've got to get to know him. Find out who he is, what he says about himself, what's his character like, what's his personality like. And so today we come to um, another saying of the I am saints, and again, nobody declares such truth like Jesus does. Nobody stands so boldly and says, I am such and such. Nobody in history says or makes the claims that Jesus does. I am the bread of life. I am the light. Man, there's powerful statements. And today, I introduce you to I am the door. I am the door. So turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. And uh, 11 goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. So I'm going to have to say, you know, not go down the adventure too far there because pastor wants to talk about that next week, that Sunday. So I am the door. John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10 says, <clears throat> Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, and to him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out, and when he has brought all when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice a stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers this figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them so Jesus again said to them truly truly I say to you I am the door of the sheep all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door, verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, steal, or steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus says this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads quickly and thank the Lord for his reading of the word. Lord, we thank you for the reading of scripture. These are your words, Lord, that you have spoken. And so we treasure them even so more. And we preach them ever so delicately based on the fact that you spoke them. And so, Lord, we just want to pray that we will receive, Lord, the way your spirit intends for us to hear the message and welcome it into our lives and into our spirit. And I pray that you would help me preach this message the way you want me to to uh, declare the promises of scripture. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So church, here we go back into the story of John's gospel. And John loves a story. John loves telling stories. And what he does is, for him to set truth, he puts it into context. He gives you a story to set truth into context. And this is a familiar Eastern story and an eastern site where you have sheep and flock and herd. And so the story would come across to those listening 
very well. They would understand exactly what Jesus was saying in the story. Now, a sheep pen would be, you know, like a, they would either build it up with bushes, with maybe thorns on the outside, or they would build it up with like rocks. And they would put like a little gate in the front where they would open, like picture like in the, in the in just in a, a landscape, in just an open area. They would build this pen where sheep would come in and stay. And then at the gate, where Jesus calls himself the door, the shepherd would normally rest there in the front of the gate. So if you came in, you'd have to come in through him, or people would come in, over, climb in, predators and thieves would try and get in some other way, but never through the door. So that's sort of the scene, an eastern tale, an eastern setting, and Jesus uses this parable or this setting and this illustration and this analogy of sheep around a pen and the door in the front, but the problem was <laughs> that Jesus explained this whole concept to them, but what does verse 6 say? You can tell me. Sorry? They did not understand. So they got the analogy, they got <laughs> the story, but they never get the message. They did not understand him, verse 6 says. He used this as a figure of speech, but they didn't understand him. Now, verse 6 right there, I tell you what, I could preach a whole message on verse 6. <laughs> I mean, Jesus was speaking. Jesus, God, speaking. And they didn't understand him. You get it? So I'm not too worried if you don't under understand me. <laughs> the grace has been extended to me as well. <laughs> no matter how well I can prepare a message, if you don't understand it, I'm okay with that. Because you know what? Some people never even understand Jesus uh, when he spoke and he gave them messages. Look, I'm just, I'm just joking. But let's move on here. They never understand him, okay? From verses 1 to 4 or 5. So he states it in verse 6. They never understand him. So verses 7 to 10, he has to come out now and state exactly the message he was trying to relate. He plainly states that I am the door. You see, you got the message. You know the sheep. You know the pen. You know the gate that stands in front of it. You know that someone only enters via the shepherd. But you're not realizing that I am the door. I am the door, he says. Now their eyes opened. Now you can have opened your eyes to this statement and like, wow, he is the door. Oh, wow, is he saying he's the door? You get it? And somewhere of the negative interpretation that what is Jesus saying? Is he blaspheming here? But what was he saying? He was saying that I am the door. Whether you like it or not, take it how you wish. I am the door. There's no gray area here now. Verses 1, 2, maybe 5, I explained the analogy, you didn't seem to quite get it, but now you know what I'm talking about. I am the door. Jesus is saying what we think he is saying, or maybe the, the, the what you call the doubters, they were like, is Jesus saying what I think he's saying? Is this man saying what I think he's saying? Is he saying that he is the door and that we got to go through him? Is he saying, is he really trying to say that? Is he saying that he is God? You see, they understood the setting of eastern pen and sheep and a cage and a, and a gate. But is he now saying that, whoa, he's God, yeah? Because the tribe of Israel always was um, likened unto sheep. As Ezekiel chapter 34 speaks of that quite a lot. But you see, what Jesus did was he cleared their doubts. He cleared their mind. Whether you received it in a positive light or in a negative, he stated, I am the door. Verses 8 to 10 goes on to say, all who come before me, you see, he makes it personal now, he states it. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them, for I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I came. Oh, Jesus came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the door, and that is my first point this morning. I don't need to explain what a door is to you. Surely, we all have doors at home. 
You all entered through a door this morning. I hope nobody bumped into a door. <laughs> you know those glass doors? I remember a friend bumped into it so hard that the door even fell off. <laughs> but a door is there for you to enter through or exit. Unwanted guests, they close the doors. <laughs> they try to come in another way. They jump over the fence or they try and break in. With our modern technology, they do jamming and scamming and they're hacking into security systems to try and get in to somewhere they're not allowed to get in. But Jesus says, I am the door and we can only enter through him. And he alone allows those who acknowledge him to enter in. You see, he stands at the door. And only if he acknowledges you can you enter. Getting to know Jesus. But he also needs to know you. And needs to know your heart. We need to acknowledge him. We have to acknowledge him. And can you see the importance of getting to know Jesus? So if you don't know him, you ain't getting in. If he finds you to be a crook, a thief, a robber, a charlatan, a, a, a sheep in wool's clothing, you can't fool Jesus. You won't be getting in. Luke chapter 13 verse 25, just quickly if you want to go there. It says this, let me get it quickly. Once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you came from. And woe be that day that any one of us be standing outside and that door is shut. So let me take you through a few passages of scripture in Psalms 118, verse 19 to 21. If Palessa can keep up with me. Psalms 118, verse 19 to 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Isn't that a beautiful verse? That as much as we can try to be righteous, we're not. So, which means we cannot enter through the gate. But do we see how blessed our Savior is? That it says he has become our salvation. Jesus embodies so much truth and so much in these verses that he speaks of being our salvation, being our righteousness, covering us with his blood. And when we are covered by his blood, we can enter in. He says, I am the door. You see, when Israel was going through the plagues in Israel or in Egypt, there was a door that had to be covered by blood. For when the, the uh, cloud or the uh, shadow of death passed through, it would go in and wipe out every firstborn. Were you the firstborn, my brother? You would have been dead. If there was no blood covering the door. Were you the firstborn? You're the firstborn. <laughs> I knew that. I discerned that. <laughs> Makes a bigger impact if you're the firstborn. Hey, Chisha. When you're the firstborn, you're sitting in that household. I'm okay. I'm the thirdborn. I'm cool. <laughs> Natalie on the other hand, I don't know. She, she's the firstborn. <laughs> when the shadow of death comes passing by, and if that blood is not on that door, woe to you. It's a scary picture. I hope to scare you this morning. But Jesus says, I am the door. Do we get the picture? Do we get the picture? Do we really get the picture? I am the door. You see, they realize what he is saying. Because the stories that they've heard from generation to generation to generation of what Jesus or what God did or what Yahweh did when they were saved from Egypt... They knew about a door being covered with blood. And now they're hearing a man talking about a door. Is he talking about that very same door that we had to cover blood over to be saved? Is he saying that he is that door? Guess what? <laughs> That's exactly what he's saying. He says, I am the door. Understanding Jesus as the door of our lives should give us a sense of security. It should give us a sense of comfort. So I don't know about you, but once I enter into my house, I open the door, and I'm cool. I'm happy. I'm home. 
Do you get that sense and that feeling of security, of comfort? I can just lounge, I can relax, because I'm in my home. No matter what's going out there, I'm inside. I'm safe. I'm secure. I even put a gate there to make sure I'm secure. You know, we still live in South Africa, so we've got to make sure, doubly sure. <laughs> you can't get into my complex, but you've got to enter a code at the gate. Then you've got to find the block. And many people have lost the block. You can't get in if you don't know which door to go to. You can't jump in, it's too high. Jesus is the door. And you've got to find him, you've got to know him, so that you may enter through that door. Getting into your home, you feel safe. When I enter into the church doors here, I feel a sense of serenity. I feel a sense of peace. And I can't express to you, and I don't know if any of you remember, during the time of COVID, when we entered through those doors, it was quiet. But it was never scary. It was never like daunting. It was never like, ooh, like gloomy. Whenever I entered those doors, it was quiet. There's only a few people there, if not any. But there was a sense of God's presence in the room, in his sanctuary. We feel safe. We, we feel like, oh man, I entered through those doors. That's a place of worship. That's a place of love and reverence to God when we enter into the sanctuary. But... Maybe some of you don't identify your homes or certain doors as a place of safety and security. Do you know the flip side is just the same or the opposite, complete opposite, is that you feel so insecure. You feel so afraid and so not sure about entering into this door and you feel that you are not where you should be. The door you went through isn't the one Jesus is speaking of. The door that you walk into is not the one that Jesus is speaking of. It's not where you should feel insecure, like you're not in a safe place. So you need to check, do a check and see if the door that you enter is Jesus. Because when you have Jesus as the door of your life, you have a sense of peace, a sense of joy, a sense of security. You see, you will never have peace. You will never find peace by entering through sliding doors, through revolving doors, <laughs> doors that allow everything in and everyone in. You know those doors in the, in the mall? You go like this and it goes like this and Acacia likes to go through it and you end up back in the same place. Hey, what, what happened here? The revolving doors, the mall doors. They're so big, so wide that they let everybody in. I hope I'm speaking to somebody there because as much as I'm joking, you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Our doors to our lives is like revolving doors, like sliding doors, open and close. Everybody comes in, everybody goes out, everybody's opinion is dictating how we think, how we operate. And so the insecurities settle in because you have put up a door that is not Jesus. You've put up a door that is filled with everybody else's opinions your own insecurities, and you have said, boom, that's my door. I don't go further than that because I'm scared. When you enter into his place, into his sanctuary, you have to feel a sense of peace, a sense of, oh, I can relax, I can lay my shoulders down, because he shields the sheep. He protects his own. He is the source of comfort and protection. And when you let him into your heart and into your mind, you will always have a sense of peace and joy. You will always have a sense of peace and joy. Amen? You see, when you feel overwhelmed and overtaken by the work stress, by the family stresses, by the lack of finances, by the peer pressure, young people, by the social pressures and the family pressures that are, are put upon you, you feel in that way because the door is not Jesus. You have replaced it with some other door, some sliding door, some revolving door, some squeaky doors. <laughs> All you hear is just noise when you open and close that door. There's some Q20 on that, on that door. 
But do you get the reality of the doors in our lives? When you enter his place, you are sheltered and protected and have safety and rest. The reason you may not have that is because, like I said, entering, entering through those sliding doors or revolving doors offer no permanent protection. They offer no permanent safety. A door that lets everybody and anything in is not the door of Christ. See, when the shepherd is watching over his flock, you know, we need to get a team to, to do this kind of illustrations for me to help you see what I want to portray here. A pen of rocks and sheep, maybe 20 to 25 inside, and at the door he sits and he relaxes there. The shepherd guards his flock. They safe. You get it? Where am I now? You see, I shouldn't have done that. When things are coming, or walking past, the shepherd is there at the door. Nothing can get in without going through him first. Listen to this. Nothing can get in without going through him first. But now remember there's free will so you can decide what comes in, what goes out, right? So nothing goes in without checking with him first. How many times have you checked with Jesus about certain decisions that you have made in your life? I have guilty of this one. Oh yeah, no, I'll do that. Oh no, I'll give that. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Oh, okay, we need that. No, you don't. Oh, you let that person into your life. We've got to pray about everything. The areas that I did bring before the Lord, <laughs> I saw God's presence in that. I saw results in that. I saw the whole way that plan turned out was good and good and, and like great sometimes. And like, wow, it's actually a blessing because you allowed Jesus to make the final say of what actually enters into the sheep pen. Because you asked him, so if you can picture some sheep here, or some people here, let's put some people here. And they come up to me, and February, I'm using you a lot today, sorry my brother. He, February says, hey, uh, Jesus, or shepherd, uh, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Uh, no, not now. You see, he's at the door. He can see what's outside. He can see if it's the right season for you to do what you want to do, the plans that you have, the ideas that you have. Yeah, you can run outside without him knowing, and you get there and you find, oh no, I should not have done that. Wolves come, boop, boop, gone. I told you, don't go outside. It's not the right time for that idea. It's not the right time for that opportunity for you to take. Check with me. I'm at the door. I'm seeing everything. I'll let you know when you can go. You see, Jesus says, I am the door. The sheep hear my voice. You've got to hear his voice. To know his voice, you've got to know him. The sheep hear his voice. And I go before them and they follow me. Problem is you don't want to lay down your crowns like that song sang. You want to do your own thing. So the next one, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an upside. Yeah, Jesus opens the doors of opportunity. And bless those who have given me this bottle of water. I thank you. Jesus opens doors of opportunity. You see, you've identified Jesus as the door. The sheep are in the pen. Oh, well, we are in the pen. But he opens up doors of opportunity. Sometimes we don't see this that way. Oh, we just got to stay stuck here in this pen. No. He says when you have settled which door you're going to put in front of your life, and I hope you put Jesus there, he will let you enter through and out and find pasture. Uh, was it verse 9? You can check verse 9. You're going to start to realize that if Jesus is the door in, in, in your life, he will know what's best for you and what's the worst for you. So what I have found is that Jesus opens doors of opportunity. For me, and I can assure you, he can open doors of opportunity for you as well. Yes, it is verse 9. It says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. All right? That's our sanctification or our justification. 
And he will go in and out and find pasture. You see that? What does that sound like? It sounds to me like doors of opportunity. Opportunity to graze and eat and enjoy what the sheep enjoy best, yeah? So likewise, Jesus is telling us, if you know me and listen to me, I will not just save you, but I can guide you and give you the opportunities that were never presented to you before. You see, the shepherd has to guard the flock at times. Hey guys, you need to stay here. There's a few things happening out there. The climate, the economy is not good for you. COVID's on the horizon. Stay put with your job. Stay put with your job. So many people have left their jobs before COVID, not realizing there was COVID coming, but just felt they needed a change in my life. It's a new year, you know, I want to try something different. Maybe I'll do this, I'll leave my job. You know, it's very stressful. I'll just try something else. I'll study something else. You know, I've been studying this degree for so long. I'll try a new path. Hey, hey. Then COVID came. Then they broke and they're struggling. You never consult with the shepherd of the pen. So, where am I here? We need to stay put for a little while. And other times, the shepherd will say, okay, the coast is clear. Let's go. There's a great patch of green grass there. Just go up the hill to the left, down the brook, and you'll find some nice land where you can chill. Chillax and relax and fellowship and drink some nice water and eat some nice grass and take a breath of fresh air. Spread your flock and your legs and <laughs> whatever sheep do, wiggle themselves and chill. Do you get it? When, <laughs> when you ask Jesus, who's at the door, is it a good time for me to start this? Is it a good time for me to do this? Is it a good time for me to do that? He's going to tell you. Either wait or definitely, let's go for it. This is, the, this is the time for you to shine. Jesus knows best. All we have to do is ask. Let me give you scripture for that. Matthew 7 verse 7 to 11 says, Ask. That's all I need to tell you. <laughs> Matthew 7 verse 7 to 11 says, Ask. And what? Hey, come on church, come on church. Ask. What will happen? Doesn't sound like any of you all received that. When you ask, it will be given to you. We don't even ask, but we do our own thing. Ask and it will be given to you. It says, don't even just ask. You know, if you find in that, seek, you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks and the one who seeks finds, well, whoever an ass receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, you give him a stone? I don't see Kevin's children receiving stones when they ask him for stuff. How many of you giving your children stones when they ask you for bread? Or if he asks for a fish, you give him a serpent. Now, at some countries, they, they might find that a delicacy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm not going there. You get the point. You get the message. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts. Oh, he says, if you are evil, you know how to give good gifts. Now, I don't, I'm looking around you. I don't see a lot of evil people here. I know most of you would give good gifts. As bad as I can be. Tadi knows when she asks for stuff, I can be very bad and hard on, you know, giving the youth stuff. But eventually they get it. <laughs> eventually they get it. Because they asked. And we love our children. We love our youth. How much more? How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? Sometimes my daughter asks me for stuff. I don't give it to her because I know she's not ready to receive it. She has to wait a little bit longer before she can get that snorkels that she wants to swim. I said, you can't even swim. What do you want to do with a snorkel? You get it? <laughs> but you know what I did? I bought it. Natalie knows we put it under the top shelf there. She can't reach it. But I saw she climbed up there the one day to take it out. We put it so high she can't reach it. And I said, when you're ready, you can have it. 
A good father knows what you want, guys. Your father knows what you want. You gotta wait. You gotta wait. Kevin, you know you had to wait like three, four years before that opportunity came. And sometimes he'll take you through seasons just to keep you going, just to keep it ticking along. Keep the finances going before he actually gives you what he has prepared for you. So the waiting period can take a bit long, but he blesses. Psalm 121 verse 8, and I'm running out of time, so I must keep going here. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. When you make him the door, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. That's where I live in this passage here. Lord, if you want me to go there, I go there. If it's for your glory, otherwise I stay put. Psalm 23 verse 2 says, and we spoke about this, we actually preached a whole sermon around this. Lie down in green pastures. He makes you lie down in green pastures and leads us beside still waters and restores our soul. Isaiah 49 verse 9 to 10, I was blessed when I was working the sermon out. Saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness. Appear, they shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them by the springs of water, will guide them. That's your God who's at the door. He will guide you. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 14 to 15, the old chapter speaks of the good shepherd. He says, I will feed them with good pasture. This is in scripture, church. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. They shall be lie, they will, they, they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture, they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. You keep on trying that forex thing and wasting your money, man. Stop it, please. Wait for the right time to God to show you how to make money the right way. He will take you up to the heights. And I say that because I lost a lot of money there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but it's never my time for that stuff. God, God is telling me to do other things. He takes us onto the heights. Where am I here? They shall, be, they shall lie down in good grazing land in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 15 says, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. Verse 15 says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. That's Jesus. He will be the shepherd of his sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't those verses encouraging? If you want them, go onto the website, maybe by this evening or tomorrow, and you'll see all the verses that's listed if you never get it now. Those verses are so encouraging that only Jesus should be given the right to our life to direct us. Jesus should be given the right to our life to direct us. For his will over our lives is good. His will over our lives is perfect. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, I know. I've been through those moments where he's doing something different and you don't like it at all. Like a shifting and a shaking and a, and a breaking and a molding and a pasting and you're like, why Lord do I have to go through this? He knows what he's doing because he's preparing you for something better and something greater. I am prepared. This is me, Byron. I am prepared to only let Jesus open doors of opportunities for me. I pose the question, how about you? How about you? See, the process can take some time. Oftentimes we rush out, and like I said, a wolf can grab you. You rush out and the storm grabs you. Remember, you're only sheep in this wide world. So we need to understand that patience in him safeguards us and he knows the best time and the right time for you for your time will come when he says right let's go so i encourage you to wait on him and he will present the right door of opportunity at the right time for you so that's basically my message church <clears throat> but i couldn't stop but add another point which is the door of the church. The third point is Jesus is at the door of the church. I hope you've been blessed by the first two points. I hope you've been blessed. But as a pastor and as a leadership, 
We need to understand where this church is going and who's at the door of this church and who's running this church. See, Jesus is at the door of the church. So when you look at doors and churches, there's some scripture attached to it. And it's in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 15 to 20, where Jesus or John is writing the letters to the church in Laodicea. Don't name your child Laodicea. It's a nice name, sounds good, but listen to what the letter says. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Verse 16 goes on to say, So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out my mouth. For you say I am rich. I have prospered. I have need of nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. You see, when you come to God, he gives you gold, but he just doesn't give you the gold. He refines it by fire. So you are basically gold that he needs to sometimes refine by fire to make it perfect and blessed and worth something, all right? He refines you by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And he will salve to anoint your eyes. I think that's like an ointment thing. So that you may see. And those whom I love, I reprove. And I also discipline. We don't like that, but he does that. And so be zealous and repent. Behold, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And therefore, I can declare that Linda's Baptist Church has opened that door to Jesus when he stood there and he knocked and we invited his presence in so that he can sit with us and be with us and he can see that we are trying our best to make disciples, having a morning class with Uncle Steady, uh, baptizing people with Uncle Kevin. We're doing things that God has asked us to do, doing evangelism and soup kitchens and youth ministries and Wednesday night services and Bible studies and devotions. That's a living church. Jesus stands at the door and he knocks and we have let him in. We want to eat with him and that's why we have communion. Next week Sunday is communion Sunday. Come and eat and drink fellowship. As much as Jesus stands at the door of opportunity that that is available to us, he also has a deep desire and a plan for his church. A church without Christ is a dead church. I don't care which church you go to or have been to. If Christ is not there, it is a dead church whose light will be removed. A church who lets Christ in, he will come in, Christ himself will come in and eat and fellowship with them. Jesus who is at the door, is the door, is at the door, he opens the door even for his church to grow and to expand. So listen to this next verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for a wide door, this is Paul speaking, a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. So we, the church, need to realize that there is a wide door open to us and a wide area for us to be effective right here at Linders Baptist or at Linders Community. We will have opposition, we will have adversaries, but over and above that, we need to trust in Jesus. And for us to trust, we've got to know him, and now that we know him, that he is the door, we can trust him. And let us carry out the mission that he has set before the church, so that we may say, turn to Revelation chapter 3 verse 8, or you can go to the last slide, which he says here in Revelation chapter 3 verse 8, he says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. We have a little church here. And yet you have kept my word. Keep his word in his heart and we as a church will keep his word. And have not denied his name. What he opens, church, no one can shut. Jesus says, I am the door. Let's bow our heads and pray. Before I speak or pray or say anything, I just want to give you a few seconds 
to just process all that you've just heard. Is Jesus the door of your life? Make him the door of your life. Journey with him being the door of your life. And then ask him for the opportunities to present itself. Because when he opens that door of opportunity, be it for the church or be it for your personal life, scripture doesn't lie. Scripture is always fulfilled. And scripture says, what he opens, no one can shut. Lord, I bring your people before you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I pray, Lord, that they will make that declaration that Jesus is the door of their hearts and their lives. I pray, Lord, that they will journey with this concept and with this idea and this message that Jesus is the door and they need to face the reality of submission to the shepherd of the door. Submit to the keeper of the flock. And only when you hear his voice do you go out. And follow him all the days of your life. And I pray, Lord, that when they do that, they will be blessed. They will be rich in you. They will prosper. They will not be shaken by anything, Lord. They will be guarded and covered by the enemy that comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. And the verse continues to say that they will have life and have it abundantly when they have you in their lives. So bless us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.